This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, episode 125. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 125 of the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this episode, we are going to be discussing the ins and the outs of upgrading a building automation system. You know, over the past couple weeks, we've received a lot of questions around firmware, BAS cybersecurity, using a BAS till it dies, or should you use a BAS until upgrades are required? How do you deal with manufacturer phase-outs? And the list goes on and on and on. And that led to this episode. You know, upgrading a building automation system is a difficult topic to discuss because depending on what you do for your day-to-day BAS job, you may have completely different, one, understandings of what upgrading a BAS means, and two, a a different care, a different motivation for upgrading a building automation system. After all, the motivation for upgrading a BAS system from a salesperson's perspective may be completely different from an owner's perspective, completely different from an engineer's perspective, and completely different from a technician's perspective. So when we talk about upgrades, let's try to narrow down that focus and talk about the three main areas that you upgrade when it comes to a building automation system. And that is the front end software, the back end software, and the physical devices. You know, a lot of folks, when you ask them, hey, are you upgrading a building automation system? they may have a preconceived notion of what that means. If I were to ask a technician about upgrading the BAS, they would most likely think about upgrading the firmware and the controllers, upgrading the configuration software, maybe upgrading the user interface, but usually it's kind of those technician tools that they use. On the flip side of that, when I talk about the owner, they're going to tend to fall into two camps, either upgrading the software, the front end, or upgrading the physical devices. Now, the first thing that I mentioned, the front end software, what that is, is that consists of a user interface. It's often called the BAS server, but that doesn't mean it's actually a server. I know, a little confusing, right? But the thing is, is that when it comes to building automation software, front end software, as I like to call it, I like to use the term front end because... We're in this, we're still in this phase where you have existing 20, 30 year installations that are using really old front ends. We're talking the green screen, Apple II kind of thing sitting in a broom closet. And then you've got on the flip side, these remote connected, open them up in your iPad or iPhone devices that are kind of the cutting edge front end, web based graphics, all that jazz, all that, those fancy words that are used in a lot of the marketing collateral that's being put out right now. Now, somewhere in between there is the definition of a user interface. So why would you want to go and upgrade a user interface? Well, for one is new features. If you haven't uh, seen it and you haven't realized it, we're in the middle of a talent shortage. You know, our training business is booming because there's not enough people who are qualified to go and execute building automation work. And, you know, that's great because we sell training to help people be qualified to execute building automation work. And, you know, when there's a gap, that means there's a need. But that also has an effect on the user interface, which is a lot of the features that we used to not really care about are becoming increasingly important. For example, remote remote access. Really hard to access a Commodore 64 system that's sitting in a broom closet and doesn't even have a modem installed in it. It's really hard to access that. So one of the large motivators for upgrading building automation systems has to do with new features, remote access, web-based user interfaces, heat maps on the user interfaces, different reporting capabilities, all these new features. Now, in some cases, these new features are great things. In other cases, these new features, they're not that valuable. They're basically vanity features. You know, if you've got your graphics set up right, then... The ability to have graphics that change color based on if the room's hot or cold, you know, 
That's a vanity feature versus someone who has a bunch of remote office buildings, that remote login capability, remote monitoring capability, that may very much be a feature that's tied to an ROI. The next reason that everyone seems to talk about, but no one seems to upgrade the building automation system because of it is security. And this is a huge one. You know, there's been some minor hacks that have happened in the past couple of years. You might have heard of them. The Target hack, the IoT DDoS, all these business and financial institutes getting hacked into. And we in the building automation industry, we don't exactly have the best reputation when it comes to cybersecurity, mainly because for the longest time, the philosophy has been, well, it sits under the director of facilities desk and no one ever touches it. No one even knows it exists. So what security is even needed? But now with these new features, web-based user interfaces, database as a service, cloud-based uh, web supervisors, all sorts of stuff that's in the market, comes an increased need for security. And you're starting to see this driven by governmental agencies, critical infrastructure like data centers and healthcare. They're starting to engage IT decision makers in the procurement process. I personally have sat across the table from multiple IT security groups, and it's actually one of the things that led to myself getting my master's degree in IT uh, security, also getting my CISSP and other certifications, was due to the fact that I noticed increasingly IT security folks were coming to the meetings and asking questions. And initially, it was very basic questions. You know, how do you do firewall security? How do you do port security? But then it starts getting into even more in-depth. Have you done code analysis? How do you manage patching and revisioning? Have you done white box, black box testing? All these questions, which some of them are great questions. Some of them Honestly, for the use case where the building automation system is being installed is a little bit overboard. But regardless, depending on the customer, security can be a reason for upgrading the front end software. And finally, we come to OS support or just hardware support in general. You know, up until recently, and I would argue still going on in a lot of folks' heads, is that BAS systems are 20, 30 year systems. You buy them. And you don't have to do anything with them for 20, 30 years. You leave them in the broom closet. You go down there to change schedules occasionally, maybe change set points, but that's it. I will argue that that is like the least effective way to use your building automation system. It's actually be better off if you just had time clocks and wall mounted thermostats. But the reality is there's a lot of building automation systems out there that have Windows 95, Windows 3.1, Windows 98. And the reality is the BAS software these days no longer supports those operating systems. Without going too deep into the why behind it, basically when you develop software, you develop it on a platform and the Windows platform, the Windows 10 platform or the Linux platform that is out nowadays is not necessarily retroactive to Windows 95 or you know really old Unix or Linux. So the reality is because of that, you have to upgrade your BAS software. Otherwise, you have to isolate your BAS software and it just becomes a huge headache. So that's front-end software. The major, the, the folks who are mainly being involved in those decisions are owners and potentially consulting engineers who have to advise owners on those upgrades. Now, on the completely opposite spectrum, or rather opposite side of the spectrum, is the backend software. Now this often consists of configuration software and firmware. The configuration software is pretty straightforward. This is the configuration software, the software that we as technicians would log into. We would do programming, database development, graphics, configuration, all that jazz. Now a topic that tends to confuse a lot of folks is this concept of firmware. Now firmware, if you don't have an IT background, it can be a confusing concept, but it's actually quite simple. If you think about your phone, right, your, your phone gets iOS or gets Android updates. And what that is, is that is the core code. That is the firmware 
the operating system of your phone. Well, firmware is the operating system of your field controllers, of your supervisory devices. And what firmware does is it allows your building automation system controller to, to do graphical programming, to take those graphical logic blocks that are laid out on the graphical program and turn them into core code that the processor in your field controller can process. I mean, at their core, building automation systems, they're simply hardware and they need some form of software to enable them to function. And that software is firmware. And that's why sometimes when you do firmware upgrades, you have code that no longer works because the core code, if, if firmware isn't properly managed, which in some cases it's not, in some cases it is, but if firmware is not properly managed, then what happens is that when you go and write code in one version of the firmware, and then you upgrade the firmware, that code is broken. I remember this in really great detail was working on a central plant. And you know the rule is you never do upgrades on Friday. Well, I've broken that rule multiple times and each time it's backfired on me. But I was at a central plant and it was, it was to give you an idea, magnetic bearing chillers were just starting to become popular. And this is uh, kind of gives you an idea when this was taking place. And I went and downloaded the firmware to the central plant. And all of a sudden the tower starts shooting water, the VSD starts oscillating. It was just craziness. It turns out in this latest version of firmware, there was a central plant optimization strategy that was enabled. And I'm sure they let us know about it, but I didn't read the firmware notes. And so I didn't know that it, I just figured, oh, it's, you know, it's new firmware comes with some new graphics capabilities. I didn't realize it was going to change my code base. And so when I went and did that upgrade, the code, I basically spent the entire Friday and part of the Saturday going and fixing code. And that's what firmware is. Firmware is this code that runs on your controllers, runs on your supervisory devices and enables them to do functions. So that's why when you change firmware, or you develop some software in a different version of firmware, it doesn't work. It's because even though the logic blocks look the same, potentially the code that is behind those logic blocks is actually different. Now, some folks call it firmware, some folks call it library, some call it the kernel, but it's essentially the core code that allows the controllers to function. Now, there is a third area that is upgraded, and this is physical devices. And in the case of physical devices, the reality is that you just have to upgrade physical devices sometimes. You know, the controllers that exist today are massively different than controllers just 10 years ago. And to see this illustrated, think of cell phones, right? Cell phones, would they really start to become popular in 2004, if I remember correctly? I, I may be a little bit off. But the cell phone today is massively different than the cell phone of 2004. And when I say cell phone, I meant smartphone. I know that cell phones have been around for a while, but smartphones, the, the ones like the iPhone and the Android phone, they've only been around a little bit of a decade, but there's been massive increases in their capability to have memory, to have CPU, to process images. And we're seeing the improvement in controllers and what they're able to do now. I mean, a lot of folks will say to me, Phil, BACnet MSTP controllers are just fine. Why do we need IP controllers? And it's a good question to ask. And you know, as I sit there and think about it, there's certain functionalities that just work better with IP. For example, using a user interface, the way that HTTP information is communicated, could you do it across a MSTP token? Absolutely, you could do it off MSTP. Problem is, the way that you set up a web user interface is you use HTTP and HTTPS, and you use TCP, and you're like, what the heck does all this gobbledygook mean? Basically, you're setting up a persistent connection. 
But token passing is not a persistent connection. Token passing, those serial networks, are dependent on one device talking at a time. Now, if you are wanting these multiple devices to be talking across the wire at the same time, that is where IP technology sets become really invaluable. So if you're wanting to do user interfaces at the edge, if you're wanting to do analytics at the edge, if you're wanting to do graphics and databases at the edge and all sorts of IoT concepts, then you really need to move to more of an IP infrastructure and less of a serial network infrastructure. Now, I know for some of you that may be like, okay, so what? But the reality is, is that with this skill set shortage, I'm a betting man in saying that we're going to see analytics, workforce automation, those kind of things, as well as outsourced services become increasingly important to the success of our industry. And in order to do that, we need technology sets that enable that. So what does this mean to the average user who's making an upgrade? Well, from a controller perspective, if your controllers are 20, 30 years old, I mean, there are just massive differences in just the sequences that we've discovered. 20, 30-year-old controllers are application-specific controllers typically, and they're running very basic, well, I don't want to say inefficient, but less efficient sequences versus the controllers of today where you've got optimized central plant and air handler control built into the default code base you've got an opportunity for massive improvement in comfort and control, not to mention the capability of data monitoring and data reporting that comes with these new controller sets. So with all of that being said, that is what tends to drive folks towards these hardware upgrades. So then with all this being said, why do we upgrade? Well, if you haven't picked it up yet, the answer is different based on the area and depending on the user. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mentioned a little bit earlier about cybersecurity and how cybersecurity is becoming increasingly important. But it's probably not increasingly important to a multi-tenant, low-cost commercial real estate office building. It is increasingly important to a highly mission-critical pharmaceutical or a Department of Defense building. So area, often known as vertical market focus, is really important when it comes to upgrades. If you're trying to position an upgrade, and this is for you sales folks out there, if you're trying to position an upgrade, and by the way, technicians, you're salespeople. Seriously, get in your head that you being able to upsell your customers on things that they need, not only are you doing your customers a service, which is really important, but you're also creating future work for yourself. And that is a personal responsibility that you need to embrace. Okay, off my uh, soapbox on that one. But when you are going and communicating about why to upgrade, or if you're an owner and you're trying to understand if you should upgrade, you need to understand your core mission of your business, which I would hope you know as an owner. And you also need to understand kind of what these different three levels, the software, front end, back end, and controller systems have to do with that mission. So let's take an example, a hospital. You have a hospital and you're getting temperature complaints from patients and you have application specific controllers and they have very few points on them. And by the way, they're pneumatic. Well, you have pneumatic points coming into an application specific controller. So you've got a recipe for disaster going and upgrading your controllers to a new modern controller base, maybe not IP, maybe still MSTPP or MSTPP. <laughs> I'm not going to edit that out. MSTP. Wow. I spoke way too fast on that one, but with MSTP controllers, now you have a better code base, you have greater capabilities, you have better granularity of monitoring, you're able to impact that patient experience, that temperature control, and your patient satisfaction surveys are going to go up, which directly affects your reimbursements. So that is a positive mood or positive move. Man, I cannot speak in this podcast episode for some reason. That being said, next you have this commercial office building. And this commercial office building has generic tenants, maybe a realtor, maybe an insurance agency, et cetera, et cetera. 
you're not going to go and be concerned with having DOD level encryption of your data at rest and making sure that you have secure VPN tunnels into your BAS system and all of your login data is encrypted. That is not a focus area for you. However, if you own a hundred of these office buildings, a focus area may be remote access. And that may be a reason why you remote upgrade the firmware and your supervisory devices and upgrade your front end software so that it supports HTTP and it supports web-based user interfaces. It supports remote access. This would be a decision made both on vertical market as well as need. So this is what I'm talking about. So as an operator, your main focus areas with upgrades tend to be your ability to quickly process data so that you can make decisions. You want to have controllability, but more important than controllability, you want to have visibility to data. Visibility is huge. We've got a uh, voice message, which by the way, if you haven't seen it, if you go to buildingautomationmonthly.com in the bottom right-hand corner, I believe, there is leave a voice message and you can simply record directly from your phone or your computer a voice message for us and we can answer it in a podcast episode. We're actually going to answer our first voice message in next week's podcast episode, which we got from a director of a hospital down in Texas. And he's asking about the top three things a operator should do to effectively utilize their building automation system. And we're going to talk through those. But an operator, when it comes down to it, we've all seen the 40,000 unacknowledged alarms. Everything's in override. It's just craziness and crazy. It's like that picture of the data center. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's wires everywhere and just looks like a giant mess of spaghetti. Well, we've seen building automation systems that are like that. We've also seen building automation systems where we come in, everything's clean. They immediately have a triage process. And what it comes down to is the data is easy to understand and act on. So for an operator, anything that can increase the ability to visualize the data, prioritize and respond to the data is going to be a good upgrade. From a technician perspective, that we're going to see on the flip side. Typically, enhances in our productivity tools are going to be very important, making sure that we are keeping our controller upgraded when necessary if they provide increased capabilities that are good for the end user. Those are going to be our primary focuses. And then you have the engineering area. And these folks, what they need to be aware of is, and this is a little harder because it's vendor specific, but you need to be aware of migration paths, especially if you're a contractor or design engineer who's heavily engaged in the tenant finish out or the retrofit or retro commissioning world, then you need to be cognizant of the migration paths of the major building automation systems. Now, fortunately for you, most of the major building automation systems, the ALCs, the Johnson Controls, the Siemens of the world, are going to have design guides and salespeople who are going to help you with that. Where you start to struggle is where you get into the Tritiums and Sedona frameworks of the world. You know, the, the Tritium devices, the contemporary controls, the easy IOs. Those are more dependent on contractor model. So basically a contractor buys through a supply house and then is a rep to install that versus the branch model. I'm not saying whether one is better than the other. You just need to be cognizant of the support that comes with those two different models. All right, so let's summarize this up. And then I've got a question for you. So there's really three areas you can improve or rather you can upgrade a building automation system. That's the front end software the backend software, and the physical devices themselves. We talked through the main reasons why you'd want to upgrade each category, and we talked through the different folks who would want to go and upgrade and how you really need to look at your business goals as well as the vertical market you're in to see if the capabilities granted to you by an upgrade actually apply to what you're trying to achieve. Now, with that being said, I'd love you to go into the comments section at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 125 and let us know 
why do you upgrade a building automation system? Or why do you see customers upgrade building automation systems? We'd love to have a dialogue with you and see your reasons behind making that decision. That is definitely a hot topic right now, especially as the folks who have been able to maintain these legacy systems are starting to retire and exit the workforce. We're finding that maintaining legacy systems is becoming a cost that we simply can't bear as an industry. So it's very, very, very much for or at the forward of my mind, at the front of my mind, this topic of going and upgrading systems. I know it's not something sexy. It's not as sexy as IoT and analytics and this and that. But it's a huge topic that needs to be addressed if we are going to be successful. So go to buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 125. And in the comment section at the end of the page, go and leave what your reasons as an owner, if you're an owner, or what you've seen owners decide if you're a technician or an engineer for upgrading a building automation system. And any questions you have about upgrading a building automation system, it'd be more than happy to answer those. And by all means, check out our free voice question software. It should be in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And you click on it and leave us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a ton. And we'll talk to you next week when we dive into episode 126, where we're going to go through a four-part series of how to optimally use a building automation system as an operator or owner. Thanks a ton for being here. Can't wait to talk to you in next week's episode. Take care.